Today we're going to talk about phosphorus and how it doesn't move at all in many soils around the world. Yes, this one particular nutrient doesn't move like you're going to find nitrogen moving or boron or sulfur. So we have to manage phosphorus a lot differently for a couple of reasons. First of all, we get really worried about phosphorus moving into water. Phosphorus is the number one water quality issue we have in the United States today. It's not nitrate. I, I mean, don't forget about nitrate, but it is not nitrate. It is phosphorus. So here's the thing. When we know it doesn't move in soil, I want you to think about this for a second. If you were to place all your phosphorus down even two or three or six inches deep, um, how's it going to get into water? It's not because it doesn't leach in soil. The only exception I would say to that is when we have lighter soils and when you have thousands of parts per million of phosphorus, yes, then it's possible your phosphorus could be a little soluble. But when we're talking about heavy ground, not a lot of rainfall, and normal levels of phosphorus, 100 parts per million, 200 parts per million, you're not finding phosphorus move at all. It takes decades for it to move an inch or two. Well, how are we getting phosphorus to move in soil? You may say, well, I broadcast my phosphorus out of my fields. Am I in trouble? I'm, I'm tilling it in. How deep will I actually be able to move it? Let's say that your tillage tool is working at a five inch soil depth, or let's, let's say six inch, just for a round number. If you're tilling six inches deep, Typically, we're only getting that phosphorus to move down about half the depth of the tillage. Yeah, but Darren, don't forget, you do tillage the next year, now you're half again, so now you might be down from three, now you're down to four and a half. You do it again, you do it again, you do it again, you are moving some phosphorus down in the ground, and that's what we find. But if you're in no-till, for example, and you're laying the phosphorus on the soil surface, it is not getting into the soil hardly at all. Maybe an inch after a few years, that's about it. So that's the reason why we find a lot of nutrient stratification where we've got a layer of phosphorus and then we have very little. So it's two problems, number one, environmental, and number two, it's not where you need it for your plants. All right, so how do we put on the phosphorus? For no-till guys, this is a big concern. Can I put it on in a two by two or can I drop some in furrow or something, at least so it's not on the soil surface? You certainly can. But you do have to keep in mind, you haven't moved it very far. You're not going to be moving it any further. Uh, so that's going to be a long-term concern. Uh, we have talked to some no-tillers that say, you know what, about every so many years, I'm going to do some deep injecting. And it may be a slight amount of tillage. I really don't want to do it, but I got to do something to get phosphorus down deep. The observation has been made, and we've made the same observation on our farm, that we get root systems that are going down for that phosphorus. And we have a little better tolerance to drought and dry weather in the middle of the summer because our roots are getting what they need down deep in the soil. And there's moisture down deep in the soil, so that's a big key. All right, so when you're pulling your soil test this fall, there are several different tests that can be run for phosphorus. The two that we really like are the Bray test and the Olson test. The Olson test we find as more accurate in higher pH soils, so anything above a seven, we tell you run an Olson test. That'll tell you parts per million that is available in that soil. With the Bray test, we believe those are a little more accurate in lower pH soils. So anything below seven, you can run the strong Bray and the weak Bray. The weak Bray, or P1, is going to tell you available phosphorus. The strong Bray, or P2, is going to tell you available plus a portion of what's in reserve in the soil. So in other words, if you find you've got a tremendous amount in the P2 and very little in the P1, that tells you there's something kind of tying up your phosphorus in that soil if you would address that, maybe it's a pH issue or some other nutrient in excess, if you address that, then more of that phosphorus will come available for free. So let's just give you an example of how important this nutrient is. Let's say you had 250 bushel corn this year, and you pull up the Ag PhD Fertilizer Removal app, and you type in that 250 bushel corn, you see you're going to pull 127 pounds of phosphate out of the ground. 87 of those pounds leave with the grain at harvest time. That means if you didn't even put 87 pounds of phosphate out this year, you're going backwards. And if you're going to put soybeans in next season in this field and you figure, well, I've got a two-year fertility program, you're going to really go backwards. So let's look at the phosphate that's on your soil test and start figuring out how much you actually have. Okay, so just as a quick example here, let's say you pulled a zero to six inch test. To convert parts per million to pounds per acre, you're going to multiply times two. So let's say we have 10 parts per million. Multiply times two, that's 20 pounds per acre of phosphorus. Now you're gonna to have to convert that to phosphate 
to be on the same page as even figuring out, all right, like MAP and DAP, for example, you got 1846-0 or 1152-0. The numbers there, the middle number, that is the phosphorus number, but it's not phosphorus, it's phosphate. So we always want to convert everything over to phosphate. So anyway, if I have 20 pounds of phosphorus in the ground, I multiply that times 2.3. So 20 times 2.3 is 46. So even though my soil test says 10 parts per million, I actually have 46 pounds of phosphate in my soil. Now, is that going to be enough for, for 250 bushel corn? Is it going to be enough for 150 bushel corn? No and no. One other thing that you didn't calculate in, Brian, is that organic matter is going to mineralize each year, releasing some soil phosphate. We generally figure four to seven pounds of phosphate is going to come available from each 1% of organic matter. All right, last thing I want to leave you with, because a lot of people are dead set on, oh, phosphorus is bad for the environment. That's absolutely incorrect. In fact, we want more phosphorus, and that'll be better for the environment. Here's why. Because if a plant is short on phosphorus, the plant doesn't produce as much, doesn't produce as many roots, and guess what? Your organic matter levels theoretically could go down. We know it's better for the environment when our organic matter levels go up. So we want to have lots of phosphorus, but the problem with the phosphorus and the reason why we're having issues with water contamination is placement. It's where it's at. We've got to put the phosphorus down into the ground and then we want to reduce erosion. So if we can virtually eliminate erosion, we place more of our phosphorus down in the ground, now we have fixed the environmental issue. Having the right amount of phosphorus out in your fields is so important for your crops and controlling our weed of the week is another one of those steps that you're going to need to take to get high yields. We'll show you how to stop this week's weed coming up later in the show. <music>